Okay, great. All right, thanks for a great workshop. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to be talking about yes, yeah, steps towards more human-like learning in machines. Um, this will probably be somewhat of a change of pace from the other talks. Uh, it'll be less technical than most of them, and it really reflects my twin identities, as Roger said, of somebody who's really working between cognitive science and AI, where the goal is really a twin goal of trying to reverse engineer human intelligence and how it arises in the brain and mind. And that means to do our science, do cognitive and neuroscience like an engineer, so to give models and theories that look like engineering accounts, and then to use those to build more human-like forms of machine intelligence. I think this is, you know, this is really the origins of all of, all of our fields, cognitive science, neuroscience, AI, they all grew up together in the 1950s and have continued to this day. But this is a uniquely exciting time because AI is here in such a big way. But I think we all have to recognize, and those of us who are you know, on the front lines of machine learning certainly would, would recognize that there's a, it's a big difference between what you could call a useful AI technology and what you might call real AI in the sense that the field originally envisioned, and that at least some of us are interested in working on. Namely, AI that doesn't just do something that a human does as well or better, but that has that flexible general purpose kind of common sense that a person can use to do every one of these things for themselves. Now, granted, not everybody in, in AI wants to build that kind of AI. And there's really good questions we should ask. Can we build it? Do we want to build it? What, in what form do we want to build that kind of thing? Um, but that's what I'm interested in. It, certainly, in the, that's the long-term goal in, where the engineering agenda and the scientific agenda most dovetail. And the work that I'm going to talk about here and that we do in our group, it really takes as its launching off point the gap. Why is it that we have all of these useful AI technologies and, and increasingly a very useful toolkit for building more of them, but nothing like flexible, general purpose, common sense, say. Now, there's many ways to point to this gap. The way I, I usually do this um, is, to, is to talk about the difference between pattern recognition and function approximation, which are certainly part of what we would call intelligence and intelligent behavior. Um, and that's really where the modern machine learning toolkit has really, of course, focused and done exceedingly well. But intelligence is, is, is not just that. And in particular, it's all the things that we would call modeling the world, all the ways that our minds create models of the world to not just recognize patterns in our data, but to explain and understand what we see, to be able to imagine things that we could see but haven't yet, to be able to plan actions and solve problems to make those things real, and then to build new models as we learn more about the world. And my, you know, my goal in my research is to try to reverse engineer these modeling abilities. And I wanna to talk today about the prospects for machine learning to be advancing that agenda. Um, I wanna start off just being a little bit controversial. This is designed to be controversial, but I often have my doubts about whether machine learning in its current mainstream form is really well positioned to do this. Certainly people in machine learning use a lot of these words. We talk about like model-based RL, for example, or imaginative learning, or certainly we have really good AI planning algorithms and so on. Um, and we might talk about learning generative models, and those are all things that I've worked on. But I think it's also important to recognize that in machine learning these days, there are certain kind of um, dogmas or basic fundamental principles that I would call myths, at least as far as natural intelligence goes. These might be very useful for building machine learning, but so when I call them myths of machine learning, I don't mean to say there aren't good ways to do machine learning, but I mean machine learning as it speaks to the broader AI agenda. Um, so one uh, well-known and much discussed idea is the slogan, something like, the less you build in, the better it's likely to work. So for example, Rich Sutton uh, famously articulated this a couple of years ago in his Bitter Lesson essay, right? Um, or the idea that learning should be driven by a single master algorithm. So Pedro Domingos wrote a really excellent popular book on machine learning, which talks about the field's obsession and quest from different directions to try to come up with one master algorithm that should drive learning and thereby um, all of intelligence. And again, I'm not trying to say that, that, um, uh, that, let's just say the blank slate RL approach to sort of try to build in as little as possible and learn as much as you can from data um, hasn't been successful in some quarters, or that the search for a single master algorithm hasn't been extremely productive. I, again, I've worked on some of these kinds of things. But I think from a scientific point of view, it's just not the way human intelligence works. It's not the origin of intelligence um, in humans, unless we're talking about evolution. 
both biological evolution and cultural evolution across very long time scales. And again, I don't think uh, Sutton or Domingos would disagree with this. I think if there's any master algorithm, it would be evolution, right? And, and the basic algorithmic interpretation of selection processes there. But if we wanna talk about how intelligence arises in an individual human lifetime, how the brain and the mind develop from birth, which is the thing we can most easily study in neuroscience and cognitive science, then we have to acknowledge that the brain really comes with crucial systems built in that developmental psychologists often call core knowledge. And learning operates both within these core systems and beyond them. And it's driven by the interplay of really multiple kinds of algorithms and representations. So reverse engineering means trying to figure out those things. Okay? And I wanna talk about where machine learning can play a role in that and how this can also advance machine learning. Maybe another way to dramatize this tension is to look to one of the very earliest proposals for building human-like intelligence and machines. Um, this is namely Alan Turing's famous paper on computing and intelligence. This is where he proposed the Turing test, most famously, but he also proposed his what, he, what was his best idea for building a machine that could pass the Turing test. Namely, it wasn't to build a machine that could imitate an adult's mind, rather it was to try to produce a program to simulate the child's mind, right? Um, and then teach it like the way we might teach a child. Why do this? Well, as he famously said here, it's presumably it'll be simpler and maybe work better, okay? Um, and again, I'm just trying to um, cite the long history of these machine learning dogmas. Presumably the child brain is something like a notebook as one buys it from the stationers, rather little mechanism, lots of blank sheets, right? Um, he's not suggesting what the learning algorithm is, but he then goes on to have some ideas about what that might be like, right? But I think it's fair to say that what we now know, and here I'm looking to the work of some of my great colleagues who work in developmental psychology with infants and young children, like Elizabeth Spelke, the first person you see here, or Rebecca Sachs, or Alison Gopnik, or Laura Schultz. Okay. Um, we now know that you know, Turing, brilliant as he was, was wrong about, in some sense, that the presumptions he was making. He was smart enough to mark them as presumptions, right? And we didn't really have a science of children's cognitive development then. So it, these were fair things to presume. But we might say now, and, and framing it in these terms of like, what is the inductive bias or the starting state of the human learner and what are the learning algorithms? There's just a lot more to the starting state than we might have proposed. And learning algorithms might be a lot more sophisticated and in some ways a lot smarter. Whereas machine learning, I mean, takes stochastic gradient descent as the paradigm case, right? Has really been all about trying to find basically a very simple, dumb, scalable mechanism that when you scale it up with more and more compute and more and more data it becomes smarter and smarter. I mean, that's not, it's not that that's all of machine learning, but that, that is what we tend to be looking for as a field. Um, whereas, you know, when we think about how children learn, um, though there might be a role for something like gradient descent, um, a lot of the best work on children's learning falls under this idea of what you could call the child of scientist. The idea that children, like scientists in some ways, form abstract theories about causal mechanisms they learn by trying things out, doing experiments, which, you know, like, like scientists playing around in the lab, it's children playing around in the crib. <laughs> and they build on these core cognitive systems, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, but you know, this is the built-in understanding of the world, let's say, in terms of objects and agents and their causal interactions. So what I've been trying to do in, in my research program over the last number of years is to put some math and engineering content behind these ideas. So I'm gonna talk about these things called the game engine in your head, which is just also kind of a slogan, but I'll show you how that, what, what that means in engineering terms. Or the idea of sort of an algorithmic complement to the child as scientist, the idea of the child as coder, namely al algorithmic methods for um, uh, building and modifying our theories that look something like programming, drawing on techniques like from program synthesis, for example. Okay, so um, to, to be a little bit more precise, what do I mean by the, this common sense core knowledge? Well, let me show two videos of one and a half year old babies. Now, these are these are um, these make nice videos, but a lot of the, the science really starts much younger than this. It starts with three month old babies. And the roots of what I'm showing you here in one and a half year olds, you can already see if you do really careful scientific experiments with three month olds. It's hard to do these experiments. Um, three month olds don't look like they do anything, but by looking at where they look, what they pay attention to, um, where they look longer or less long, um, you, you can even use sort of uh, uh, various uh, sucking methods um, 
there's lots of ways to get data, or there's some, some useful ways to get data out of really young two and three month old babies, let alone the older children that you're seeing here. But when we talk about core knowledge, we mean these kinds of things that any young child can do, but no AI system, like the intuitive physics of a child who's playing with blocks or stacking up cups, right? Think about the kind of understanding they have to have of the world, not just in terms of patterns and pixels, but of actual real things and the forces by which the objects interact with each other and they can manipulate them. And you see a child like this one forming plans, debugging them when they go wrong, plans that involve goals and sub goals, like making a small stack to put onto another stack to make an even larger stack. You know, it's, it's really just quite remarkable. We don't have, we have robots that can manipulate objects, but nothing that has this kind of flexible and really creative common sense way of manipulating objects to achieve goals. Or think about over here on the right, this is a video from the famous experiments done by Felix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello more than 10 years ago, also on one and a half year olds like the kid in the corner on the right. Oops, is this video playing? There we go. So the participant in the experiment is the kid in the back. And you know, think about what he's doing here. He's seeing somebody take an action that's not quite like anything he's ever seen before, but somehow he's still able to figure out something about what the person is doing, what their goal is, and even how to help them. You can see that by how he interacts when the person moves out of the way, and especially look at how he looks up and makes eye contact and then follows the guy's hands, right? This is what we mean by intuitive psychology as a kind of mind reading. It's the basis of our social cognition and very much the roots probably of our culture and a lot of our intelligence. We don't have robots that can do anything like this, but imagine if we could have robots like this that could help out around the house by figuring out what you're trying to do and how to help you. That would be amazing. Right? So we're a long way from having understanding of these kinds of systems in engineering terms, but this is what we're trying to build. I'll say a little bit about how we build models, not so much of intuitive psychology, but of the intuitive physics over here, um, mostly to point to where we, we, we build these models, not mostly using machine learning, but then to point to the goals for what we want um, to our machine learning systems to be able to do. Okay. So the tools that we use to reverse engineer these core systems, I'll tell you about a couple of them. One is the, what I would call the broad toolkit of probabilistic programs or probabilistic programming. Um, now people mean different things by probabilistic programming. For example, many people might think of um, a system like STAN, which is a very useful tool for data science and computational Bayesian statistics um, or other kinds of statistics. Um, which takes you know, the things that, that statisticians have long done at a small scale and lets you scale those things up in an engineering way. Right? Um, but what I'm talking about is also just the more broad notion of probabilistic programs as frameworks, both, both models and theories, but also practical tools for combining what I'd say are several of our best ideas on intelligence that really have arisen over the multiple decades of the field of AI. The original idea of intelligence as symbol manipulation, you know, drawing on the math of algebra and logic for representing and reasoning with abstract knowledge. People often, you know, uh, we might see poo-poo the idea that we should use abstract, explicit, symbolic approaches in AI given all the success using more statistical or neural methods. But I think we have to grant that this is not only the, the oldest, but the most important idea in intelligence. We wouldn't have any AI techniques at all. We wouldn't have deep learning, for example, if we didn't have symbolic programming languages, whether it's C++ or Python um, or TensorFlow or PyTorch. All of those are symbolic programming languages that do remarkable things with symbols, like, for example, automatic differentiation. Okay, That's just one example of how symbols support um, some kind of expanding human intelligence. The other good idea besides symbols and, of course, neural networks is the idea of probabilistic inference, right? especially Bayesian inference when I think about having a generative model that can capture causal relations and I want to be able to reason backwards from very sparse, maybe noisy patterns of observed effects, the underlying causes. Okay. And I'm especially interested in frameworks for intelligence that combine all of these tools and I would I would call what we, what we might call modern probabilistic programming languages and by modern here I mean since the era of deep learning. So languages like Pyro or TensorFlow probability that's been built inside Google or Gen that's been built inside MIT in the probabilistic computing group. Pyro was built inside Uber AI. Um, that's, you know, these are languages that allow you to do um, very uh, sophisticated kinds of probabilistic inferences, um, often ones that can only be expressed in symbolic languages, 
um, that involve the, the kind of data structures and algorithms for physical simulation or planning, for example, but they sit on top of languages for deep learning and neural networks. So you can also exploit the power of those tools for scalable learning and inference. So this is the broad toolkit that we work with. Um, when we want to think about how do we capture systems of knowledge like intuitive physics, um, especially if, we're, if we want to grant that it's important that there's important built-in architecture, we're not just going to try to learn everything from scratch. Here, we, we draw on other kinds of uh, software infrastructure, especially the tools of game engines. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure most people who are watching this talk are familiar with game engines, but if you're not, these you know software that was developed evolved really in the game industry that allow game designers to create rich immersive experiences without having to do everything from scratch, like all of computer graphics, but to focus on the objects, the characters, the story that give you basically very, I mean, you can think of game engines as very fast approximation programs for simulating the way light bounces off of um, surfaces, um, for simulating the physics of how objects interact, for simulating how non-player characters, other agents might plan and interact with a human player in order to give an immersive interactive experience. All right. um, now, game engines like this are increasingly useful in all sorts of machine learnings, RL and other methods, um, where we think of the simulation engine as basically the training ground for the machine learning algorithm. We generate lots and lots of diverse training data, and then we try to solve the sim to real problem to take those algorithms into the real world. The difference between our approach and that one is, we, is, is summed up by the slogan, the game engine in your head. The idea is that the game engine is in your head. <laughs> okay, that is, these, uh, this is a, these tools you can think of as a first approximation in, in certain forms though surely limited and wrong in other ways, but something like a first approximation to what evolution could have built into our brains as part of these very early core systems for thinking about objects, space, and other agents, okay? So in other words, like if we imagine a child imagining what's gonna happen when they roll this ball um, towards that stack of blocks with the toy doll on there, you know, you can imagine what's gonna happen, he can imagine what's gonna happen, and we might think of that, for example, as constructing a simulation in a game physics engine, and then, actually running it forward to see what happens. Namely, the ball hits and impacts with the blocks. The blocks, um, because they aren't glued together, uh, fall apart and the thing on top falls over. And by running something like that kind of a simulation in your head, you might be able to predict what's gonna happen, plan your actions and guide your interactions with others. So we've used these kinds of tools, basically probabilistic simulation rollouts in game physics engines to model a number of different aspects of intuitive physics. For example, in blocks world scenes like these stacks of blocks and towers here, we might ask a very familiar question, how unstable do these stacks look? Hopefully you'll see some of them look like they should be falling over, others look like they're stable. We can do behavioral experiments with humans where we ask them to make a judgment on let's say a scale of one to seven, um, how stable or unstable, high up here is stable, low down is, or so, sorry, uh, high up is unstable, low down is stable. And we can compare that on the x-axis to the predictions of this probabilistic physics simulation, which basically means we take a noisy state estimate of approximately where the blocks are. We run that forward a few time steps in the physics engine, do that a few times um, to, to get a, a very rough estimate of how much of the tower is gonna fall over. And that turns out to do a very good job of modeling people's judgments in this case. The same kind of models can answer many other questions though. And it's the same underlying model. We run the same kind of simulation. We just query it in a different way. Namely, after running the simulation, we compute a different predicate on those rollouts. So instead of looking at the percent of blocks that fall, we might look at how far they fall or which way they fall and what's the average direction. Or we might take this model and we might say, well, suppose I know that certain col colored materials are much heavier than something else, then that could change your prediction. So take these two scenes here, which have the same block geometry, but are colored differently. If the gray blocks are much heavier, you'll make a different prediction about which way they will fall. And these models that we build can capture that. Or we might make mass judgments, for example, um, by doing almost a kind of counterfactual analysis. If I see these towers that look like they should be unstable, but they're not falling over, can you infer which color material is much heavier? And I think maybe you can see that, right? Maybe yellow in the first one, maybe red in the second one, okay? Um, the same models can, can make those sorts of inferences too by evaluating those different hypotheses, running them forward and seeing what happens. Um, let me, just, for those of you who haven't seen this kind of work before, I wanna just show you in, in, or maybe we can even do a little bit of a demo here. So, you know, if we were live, I do this interactively, but just 
you know, follow along at home. Um, because I want to highlight a kind of task that we've studied, which really shows the difference between how we use these tools to capture intuitive physics and conventional machine learning. So here, you know, if, if, I, if I think about the tasks I've, I've been showing here, these are tasks for which, especially something like, will the stack of blocks fall over? We have lots of experience in our lives, and it wouldn't be hard to get robots to have that same kind of experience. We've made that kind of judgment many times before. But here, consider a task which, unless you've seen me give this talk before, or, or a talk of, on this topic, you've never uh, surely done exactly this task, right? Um, you don't have any directly relevant training set. I'm not even going to specify the task by giving a training set. I'm just going to specify the task by giving you a question in English, so a natural language sentence, which you can parse into the kind of goal predicate that can be evaluated on one of these probabilistic simulation rollouts. So here's the task. Imagine that the table here is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor. Is it more likely to be red blocks or yellow blocks? So I think here, you know, probably most of us would say red. Here, we might say yellow. Here, maybe red. Here, yellow. Here, yellow. Maybe yellow, red. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yellow. OK. Um, I'm giving my intuitions. I think um, probably you, you had, on my guess, is similar intuitions, all right? We can quantify this, as I'll show you in a second. So you can see sometimes you're really certain, sometimes you're not so certain. Um, and you know, ask yourself or think about how do you do that? So the way our model does this is it's just the same model that I'm talking about before. You construct a simulation of the scene in, in here, in this case, in a, in a simple game physics engine. And you try running it forward. Um, now, of course, I haven't fully specified what simulation you should run. I just said the table's bumped. But how is it bumped? Well, here's a small bump. And we can see what happens. Here is the same configuration, but with a hard bump. Um, and of course, I could bump from different sides of the table. But notice that for scenes like this, where you're very sure what's going to happen, um, you don't have to uh, run, or it just, it just doesn't really matter. Like detail, the details of what happens are different. But um, for the grain of intuitive physics, it's the same. You don't even have to run a simulation, um, a, a fully detailed simulation, for many time steps. If you just run a short simulation and you stop it here, you can already kind of see what's going to happen. Or similarly here, right? So just running a small number of low precision simulations, which is the way our model works, can be enough to judge, you know, approximately the answer to this and many other questions. So here's just the same kind of data plot I showed you before, with human judgments of red versus yellow on the y-axis and the average of a few model simulations on the x-axis. And you know, interestingly, the model can capture judgments in this task about as well as it can capture the judgments on a much more familiar task, like how stable is this, is this tower, right? There's no learning in, in this model so far, right? There's just thinking. <laughs> There's building and thinking. And what we build, namely this physics simulator, we think is built in the brain through a combination of evolution and development. I'm not saying everything about blocks is built in, right? One hypothesis is that something like general game engine type technology is built in, and then you have to learn the particular kinds of things that are there in your world. Now, this is the kind of thing that we're trying to explore. Like, where does learning come into the picture? So one possibility is that, you know, you learn something like this from scratch, right? Somehow in each child's mind, this is more like the deep RL perspective for example. And one of the earlier talks today, like had, you know, had a nice illustration um, in, you know, and how we can, how we can push machine learning in this way with the, you know, really interesting ideas of sparsity and modularity. I'm thinking of the billiard ball simulation that if you saw some of the talk, uh, the talk that was uh, two before uh, you would have seen, right. Um, and, you know, th there's been some interesting progress in this idea. Um, I'll point to, for example, um, my colleague Dan Yeamans um, and his lab at Stanford, for instance, um, where he and his students and collaborators have tried to build simulations of baby-like learning, where they have a kind of uh, what's probably a pretty standard curiosity-driven reinforcement, intrinsic motivation reinforcement learning system. And just by kind of interacting um, randomly with objects, pushing them around in the environment, over a long time, this agent is able to learn certain kinds of things about ego motion, to sort of uh, uh, form some kind of notion of object-based attention and maybe something about how to interact with one object. But I think for all sorts of reasons, um, this is not really the way it works in babies. In particular, 
babies, through the kinds of experiment methods that I mentioned before, even two or three month old babies have sophisticated notions of object permanence. They understand objects don't disappear when you don't see them. They can even do simple kinds of physical reasoning based on solidity for objects that are not visible, that pass behind screens. So they know a lot about objects before they can pick up or even push objects at all, right? So we think something more about objects has to be built into the system. And what we've been pursuing are various ways of learning in the game engine, if you like, um, learning how to use the game engine type idea, how to, how to connect it to your perceptual data, how to figure out what kinds of things and what kinds of physics and forces are there. Because even, you know, even in today's game engines, which are probably um, much less interesting than the ones in our head, they still have a lot of degrees of freedom about what kind of objects, what kind of forces could be in play and so on. Um, we might also talk about how you could learn some aspects of the game engine in, in itself, let alone how you go beyond this, because there's a lot of things that, that we as humans learn that are not expressible in these core systems, but that really only come into our cognitive picture once we have natural language and other kinds of formal symbol systems. So I'll point to a few examples of this. Um, for instance, in work that was done mostly by John Jin Wu and colleagues, um, also working with Pushmi, who was the first speaker of the workshop, and Bill Freeman and me, um, he explored in a number of different projects how you could take, how you could couple together some kind of intuitive physics engine. It could be a, a, a symbolic uh, game style physics engine like Bullet. It could also be a learned uh, neural physics engine or graph neural network. Um, but what I'll show you are some particularly powerful results that come from a symbolic built engine. But couple that to perception using what is, you know, pretty standard ideas from computer vision fleshed out in a couple of, or extended in a couple of interesting and important ways. But the basic idea here is to try to use, in this case, machine learning to bridge between perceptual data and the internal game engine state to see the game physics engine as essentially the target of perception. So the, so the goal of perception is not to like label regions of images, but, um, and put, put names on them, but rather to to de-render, as we say, invert the graphics process that goes from the object representation to the image representation. Um, and then that provides the, the state on which our intuitive physics can operate. So, you know, we use, I won't go into the details, but you could check out this paper. And it was published in the year before we had NeurIPS back in its old unfortunate name. So I'm sorry, I forgot to update the slide. Um, but uh, you should check out the NeurIPS 2017 paper on learning to see physics via visual deanimation if you want to check out the, um, uh, the, the details of this method. But basically, we're using fairly standard um, object detection um, segmentation pipelines to give hypotheses about where the 3D objects are. Then we can enforce a physical consistency constraints, so like objects don't interpenetrate. That gives us the state of the game engine on which we can then do the same kind of simulations I showed you before. So for instance, we can um, take scenes like these the, these ones here. And what I'm showing you is the first frame of a set of videos that were co collected by Adam Lehrer and colleagues at Facebook AI for building a more of a neural, a pure neural network end-to-end -end approach. Um, and we took the same scenes and we said, well, um, these are all examples of towers that are unstable. Hopefully when you look at these towers of blocks, you can see that they look like they should be falling over. But ask yourself, what's going to happen when we turn on the video? How are they going to fall? How are the blocks going to fall? Which ones will fall? And how will they fall? And you can imagine what's going to happen. And so can our system. So when I, when I play the videos, you'll see the real movie on the left and our resynthesized imagined videos on the right, um, where we project back out into what the images would look like going forward in time. So we've de-rendered um, using like a mask our CNN ResNet type um, uh, backbone, and then we're running a few simulate a few probabilistic rollouts for a few time steps in our um, our bullet physics engine, basically. Okay, um, so let's see what happens. And again, in each case, imagine what's going to happen when I press play, like right now. Okay, so you can see what actually happened on the left, what our system imagines happened on the right. Okay, and um, you know, again, if we watch this again, you'll see that. Um, certainly our system wasn't exactly right, right? And probably your own imagination wasn't exactly right. So on the left, we see, you know, the blocks fell too quickly and they fell sort of in the wrong direction. That comes because we can't perfectly localize where the blocks are, right? We're using machine learning to solve the inverse graphics problem here, and it's really good, but not perfect. Um, here's a few other scenes. Again, you gotta make sure you get the 3D structure of the scene. Um, 
So look at these blocks and now I'll press play. And again, you can see that what actually happens isn't exactly what our system predicts, but at the grain of intuitive physics, it's pretty close. And this is just one possible rollout. And if we took a distribution of these, it would probably look a lot like the distributions in your own head. So here's one more of these. Okay. And you, I think you get the idea. Um, again, it's not just, we're not just interested in making pretty pictures or imagining what might happen, but the same representations can also be used to plan interactions, right? So if we, if we want to keep the blocks from falling over, um, then the, the, the key point here is like what we have perceived is an object and based representation in a, an, an engine that we can use to simulate forces. So I can imagine, well, what would happen if I applied a force from this direction or this direction? Or what if I applied some glue to keep it stable, right? In other work, we've shown how the same kind of models can support how people make those kinds of action choices. You can also use the same kind of thing to make inferences, or you could call this a very low level kind of learning to learn about, for example, latent dynamical properties like an object's mass. Um, here, this is now from dynamical videos where um, we're not just making a judgment from a static scene, but we're going to look at scenes like these and say, well, from watching how these objects slide down a ramp and collide with other things, can we make a judgment about which ones are heavier or lighter? And I think it's pretty clear um, that in some cases, like the red thing on the top here seems heavy, whereas the sort of gray, shiny thing on the bottom seems much lighter, at least assuming that it's the same kind of material for the, the, the sort of wooden-like object, though it's a slightly different shape in each case. Or consider these even more interesting scenes um, where, you know, apparently identical objects um, based on for each row, but, but by interacting with other physical uh, systems like splashing into a bowl of water, or you can see what looks like sort of turning on a hairdryer or landing on a stretchy um, cloth, they, they convey different information about how heavy or light these objects are. These are all examples of stimuli that we show people in experiments and people make what, you know, what probably are the same mass judgments you're making right now. We could build models of this that use the same kinds of tools I was just talking about um, that take advantage of the fact that you can reconstruct in a simulation engine uh, different hypotheses about the relative masses of objects um, so here, this is work also done by Jonjin Wu, but especially also with Ilker Yildirim. Um, and I should say, Jonjin is, is just starting up as an assistant professor at Stanford, and Ilker just started as an assistant professor at Yale. So if you're interested in, in their work, you should check out their labs there. Um, but also Kevin Smith, who's uh, a senior postdoc and research scientist in our lab, and hopefully will be on the, in a faculty position relatively soon because he's going on the job market. So if you're hiring, you should take a look at Kevin's work. Um, but what you can see here is, again, um, a real video of objects sliding down ramps. And then you can see on the bottom um, a simulation in a physics engine where we're varying different dynamical parameters, mass and friction. And you can see that depending on how you set those initial conditions um, or those parameters for the same uh, spatial initial condition, the objects move in different ways. And that provides the basis for inferring what their physics is. We can do this in, in different ways. We can do something very close to the deanimation idea that you saw before, where we're just using machine learning to um, go from the image to the underlying simulation in a physics engine. So this was work that we did in the, in the 2015 Neuros paper, where we basically look at the look at the images of the objects where their static appearance properties, their shape, their color, and so on, are really good cues to their size and material, which means put those together, those are good cues to their mass as well as friction. And a neural network can be trained to make those guesses, which are, which are good cues, but they're only guesses. And they provide bottom-up initialization or bottom-up data-driven proposals for a more top-down inference process. We can use MCMC to relate hypotheses in the simulator, like try out different possibilities and, and then evaluate them on rollouts and do uh, run MCMC chains in the space of latent physical parameters, or we can do sequential Monte Carlo, um, a better online algorithm. Uh, but the point is there, machine learning is being used to um, make those simulations run much more quickly by giving good initializations and better data-driven proposals rather than just taking completely uh, top-down random guesses. Or we can build a more um, sort of learning-based inference pipeline. So we can do something which is sometimes called amortized inference or compiled inference, where you actually build a recurrent neural network um, to approximate the inferences from, say, a data-driven sequential Monte Carlo um, uh, inference of the system on the left. So here, you use the physics engine to train a neural network that involves a graph-structured neural network to capture the 
properties and interactions of objects, and then an LSTM to basically track the state over time of the latent properties that you're trying to estimate as the scene is unfolding. And that can be trained to approximate the inferences that would be um, slower based on the system on the left. So if we, you know, the, here part of the agenda is to say, how does the brain or how could we build machines, especially in robotics, that could make these rich inferences very fast. And, and the, the judicious combination of uh, probabilistic approximate simulation and neural networks, um, whether it's on the perception side or maybe an online inference can be very powerful there. I'll just show one other example of learning in a physics engine, and then I'll talk Are about how- One question from the audience. Um, so what is the output of the RNN? Is it the inverse graphics solution? Um, no, it's, it's the, um, so on the top you see um, material geometry and state. So the output of the RNN is estimates of the, the, um, the objects, that, uh, uh, kinematic parameters, position and velocity, but crucially the underlying material properties like mass and friction. So, so that, that's, that's what it's trained to do here. And there's a nice kind of object-based attention thing in here. It's a, it's a very sophisticated architecture that, uh, or I mean, I don't know, by, at least by cognitive neuroscience standards. And I think it has some interest on the AI side. Um, so uh, it's, uh, and it, it's only been published in a short computational cognitive neuroscience paper. That's the Smith et al. 2018 paper, but there's a longer journal paper that's in the pipeline. So if people are interested, I'm, I'm happy to send that to you. Any other questions on, on this stuff? Um, so the follow-up, um, but are those parameters part of the graphics generator? Yeah, the, so the geometry, well, the yeah, the object geometry and the state, yes, that's like the shape of the object. So the, the graphics here is the, let's, let me go back, right? So um, the it's just the, the simple kind of, uh, it's not a full, it's, we're not trying to um, match pixel by pixel, we're just trying to capture the kind of thing that you can see in this video here, where you have coarse object representations like maybe just cuboids or very simple kinds of shape approximations to the objects and basic physics engine parameters, mass and friction. So when we say there's this latent state of geometry and object state position velocity, that's what we're talking about. So a few simple shape parameters and um, positions and velocities. Okay. And, and, and there's independent reasons why in modeling intuitive physics, um, we think it's reasonable to have very approximate, let's say, shape representations, um, which have something to do with why in game physics engines, the the visual uh, shape of an object, you know, what it looks like to the graphics engine is often very complex, but the physical shape is often a simpler, like bounding box type representation that's easier to compute with in real time. And, you know, it leads to failures of approximation if you really care about modeling the ground truth physics. But um, as, as a, another one of our colleagues, Tomer Ullman, has argued, um, those actually might, th those game engine hacks, if you like, might actually correspond to some of the hacks, clever hacks, shortcuts that the brain uses, um, which might explain why they're, they're also, you know, pass well enough um, in a game style physics engine where the goal is just to look good, not to be true. But it turns out that the best way to look good <laughs> is to be true enough on short time scales, which is also what we think is the goal of intuitive physics um, at this level in the brain. Okay, so one other way of using learning, which is just, again, a little different from the way people normally do this in machine learning um, in, with a physics engine is to tackle problems, which I think are very much at the, at the front of what people are thinking about right now in robotics, where there's a lot of interest in trying to get robots to do what we call physical problem solving um, and tool use. So this means using objects, manipulating objects to solve problems to achieve goals, right? Sometimes we manipulate objects in familiar ways. Like if I want to drink and I have a water bottle, I know I have to unscrew the top, right? Or if I want to hammer something together and I have a nail and a hammer, then I know what to do with the nail and the hammer. But other times, and you know, really in, in quite interestingly, distinct, uh, distinctively, but not exclusively human ways, humans and some other smart animals, especially some smart crows, but also some other, for example, non-human primates, have the ability to use objects as tools in novel, flexible ways that they haven't really experienced much before. 
So think about like if you've gone camping and you have a tent with some tent stakes and maybe you're camping somewhere where there's pretty hard ground, so you need a hammer to hammer in your tent stake. But uh, you, you realize once you get out into the wilderness that you left your hammer at home. So what are you gonna do? You have to put up your tent, okay? You might look around to see if you can find an object that can help you achieve the same goal. So you might find these objects lying around. Which of these can you use to achieve your goal to get that tent stake into the hard ground? Well, you might quickly rule out, for example, the pine cone. You might maybe think about the stick, but nah, probably not. You'll probably quickly focus it on one of the rocks. You might have a good idea of which is the one to use, um, or you might try, like, maybe you tried the first one and like, yeah, that doesn't work as well. Let me try the second, for example. So what, what goes on here is, a, is what we would call a kind of trial and error learning, especially if you, if you don't get it right the first time. Um, but it's a very rapid trial and error learning, right? Um, this is another place where I think they're, one of the sort of standard things that people in machine learning like to say doesn't really fit with the way humans work. It's often said about, let's say, maybe um, reinforcement learning algorithms, for example, that you know they learn like humans do by trial and error. I mean, again, it's not. This is more like what what journalists and popular press and bloggers say. Um, but um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that while reinforcement learning algorithms, you know, tend to be, you know, tend to require a lot of training data, human trial and error learning is more like this. Um, we don't try for millions of trials or even thousands of trials. We try for a few trials. And if we keep making errors, most of us decide we should move on and try something else. So this is another kind of few shot learning. And we want to understand how does few shot trial and error learning work? So that, here I should say this is work by Kelsey Allen and Kevin Smith, the same Kevin as before. They're co-first authors on, the, on this work. Um, and there's a paper on this that is uh, was just accepted in PNAS. So um, there's an uh, earlier version on archive, and this version will be out very soon. Okay. So we designed this game, which we call the virtual tools game. It's a simple game that people can play, and you'll see a link so you can play it if you like too, um, where it, it works like this. Um, you, there's a simple 2D view of a physics engine, and there's a goal, which is usually something like getting the red ball into the green goal. The black, black shows immovable fixed surfaces. Um, Red things move, blue things move, and the key thing about this game, as you'll see in this video, is you just make a very simple choice. You pick up one object as a kind of tool, and then you drop it in the scene, and that's it. That's all you can do. So here you see they just this person just barely failed to achieve the goal. Okay, it's a, it's very simple in that you really make one discrete choice, which object to use, and then one continuous choice, where to put it. Okay, but there's still quite a lot of range of versions of the game, kinds of plans that you can make to solve different kinds of problems. So here, it's the same goal, get the red ball into the green space. But now think about what's going to happen when, again, red and blue things are free to move. And you you can probably imagine what, what would happen if you don't place anything into the scene, um, ways in which it might not work. But now you think, OK, well, what can I do with the objects I see and where can I place them? So you might do something like what, what this person is doing. And sure enough, that achieves the goal. Right. So you can see probably there's a lot of potential here and people do a lot of interesting kinds of trial and error learning. But again, it's something that unfolds over one or a few trials, you know, usually by 10 at most. So you might have scenes like this one here where this person um, tries to knock the object in from the side. Um, but then, yeah, kind of quickly realizes that's not going to work. And they try a very different strategy. Right. Um, notice here they they chose a different object and they switch to something that seems like a kind of what we might call a catapult strategy. But well, they realize, okay, that didn't quite work at first. I need to generate more um, momentum. So they realize they should drop it from higher. That's a typical kind of smart trial and error learning that happens here. Now we have some other things which are sometimes a little bit less smart. So sometimes people try something out which just totally doesn't work. Um, and then they might kind of try the same thing again. <laughs> um, and you know, so it's not to say that um, People are always doing something better than like uh, you know a deep Q network, but for the most part, people then you know are trying. They think of trial and error learning as trying to debug your plan. Basically, um, there could even be quite you know there could be things like this one, which is a really hard problem to solve. People try out lots of different kinds of things before they finally hit on a good solution. Um, for reasons of time, I'll just sort of jump forward. But here, people might try five or six or seven different things until they kind of get what's almost like an aha insight. They see, oh, wait, I can do something totally different. Instead of trying to 
knock it in from the side, I can sort of hook something around and oh, that, you know, there again, you get the idea, then you have to sort of find the right parameter of where to drop it in order to make that work. So we've built a very simple, I would call it almost a sort of a baseline cognitive model here. What we call the ESSA model. It's, it's similar in some ways to Dynatype models, but really it's more about the planning than any kind of um, reinforcement learning. The, we imagine using one of these physics simulation engines that you, you start off with some prior on basically trying to cause interactions. You want to exert force somehow on a movable object in the scene. So that gives you an initial guess of where you might place objects. Then you run a few mental simulations in your head. So you run forward in your physics engine in your head until you find something that might work, and then you try it out. And if it does work, you're done. And if not, you try to basically update that prior using a kind of, um, uh, let's say, we basically are using a kind of reinforce algorithm. You can think of the, po the prior as like a policy prior, and you're trying to update it, but you want to update from a very small number of examples. So you have a very simple parametric like Gaussian representation. And we've, um, you know, we've, we've applied we, where we can test people's performance on a very wide range of different levels that pose different problems. And what we can see here, here I'm showing these learning curves where basically um, along the, uh, this, is, this is number of trials and what I'm showing is um, how the cumulative probability of success for humans versus the model. And the few shotness is the sense that usually it takes only a few trials, maybe three, five, 10 at most, not always. But the model also does a pretty good job of capturing what's hard or easy for people. That's, that's what you can see in, in, in this, this plot here. It also can make pretty good predictions across most but not all levels about where people actually put things, right? So we're really getting something at the kind of planning that people are doing here, both predictions of the initial placement, where they try when they really don't know how to solve the problem, but also their final placement after they've converged on a good solution. There are also some mistakes that it makes. So there are situations where the distribution that the model makes, you know, there are key places, the, the, models, the model here is the color and the dots are people. So here you can see there are lots of human placements that the model isn't capturing. And basically these are cases where the model's prior is too simple or it fails to capture some of the extended planning that humans can do. And these are all things that we continue to work on basically. There's a lot of more interesting learning to do. How do we, can we, can we learn the prior and object placements? Can we learn strategies like catapulting? Can we learn more higher level symbolic planning models? that allow us to assemble multi-step plans compositionally from known operations? Or can we learn when a new physical property is introduced? And these are all things that Kelsey and Kevin have been working on and have started to make some progress on. So again, I, what I'm just pointing to this as a way to illustrate what it would be like to do machine learning inside a richly structured um, model-based simulation engine. But the last thing I want to talk about is what may be the most interesting challenge from a machine learning point of view is could we actually learn that simulation engine, right? How do we learn something like a physics engine? Through some combination, again, you could try to learn it all from scratch, or you could try to learn it from some combination of more general architecture built in um, and the right kind of experience, all right? Um, now, this is a really hard problem. Um, we like to call this the hard problem of learning because if we're trying to learn what's basically a simulation program, a very flexible simulation program, then we have to do something like search in the space of programs as opposed to like in a neural network um, where we're searching in wait space. Here, we're searching in the space of simulation programs, right? Um, this is you know, part of the, the very broad class of problems that you could call program induction or um, program synthesis, right? We were trying to, but or inductive program synthesis. We're trying to have an algorithm that's a program writing program, right? Um, and there's no nice topology or geometry for the space of programs. So it's just a much harder search problem. And again, I'll just, uh, you know, one, one more slogan, which is just, this is, this is not something that is engineering, but then we'll talk about ways we can try to make this into engineering. Um, I think if you think about all the ways that we, when we're programming, all the activities of programming to make our code better, right? Um, in a sense, this is, I think, a very fertile metaphor for thinking about children's learning, where the goal of learning is to improve your mental code, to make it better or just more awesome in all sorts of ways, to make it not just more accurate, but more efficient, more reusable, more explainable, more elegant, maybe. Um, and um, you know, think about all the different ways that we modify code to achieve our goals, right? Um, not just tuning parameters of existing functions like we do in gradient descent or most machine learning methods, um, but all sorts of ways of writing new code, debugging, writing libraries of code, adapting code from old libraries or from old 
projects to new projects, maybe writing whole new languages, right? I think all of these activities of programming have analogs in children's learning, and we want machine learning systems that can do all these things. So the work that we did that Rich Zemmel talked very nicely about in his talk uh, yesterday on one-shot learning, um, this is partly what it was about, right? We were trying to think about how do you learn a generalizable object concept like the Segway, um, and you know how can you learn and generalize from one example, as as Rich showed, um, and we developed this omniglot domain, which a lot of people have now used for meta learning and few shot learning. Um, you know, not because we were interested in character recognition or even because we were interested in meta learning, although that was one of our goals, but because we wanted to generally have like an MNIST style, very simple test bed for how do you learn a generalizable object concept from one example. And we had good reasons to think that the way people do it is something like writing a little program. Right, so this is like, think of this as one-shot learning as a warm-up for the more general problem of learning programs, where we might ultimately get to something like learning a game engine program, okay? Um, so people, people can, you know, as, as Rich pointed out, take a single example, and the hardest versions of the one-shot classification problem is where I give you a bunch of distractors from the same alphabet, or like over here, but you can still see, okay, if this is, uh, this is an instance of a character, you can still see down here, there's another one of the same character, right? It's not that easy, but you can recognize, most people will agree, this is the same kind of thing as that, even if you don't know this alphabet. Although there are other structures that are quite similar, right? Um, but people are nearly perfect on this task, okay? Especially if they take a little bit of time. So how do we think you do this? Well, the model that we built, this is Brendan Lake's work. Um, he's now at NYU. Uh, again, Rich talked some about this, um, and he did this also with Russ Solikudinov, um, is, we, is, is we think about um, how you might draw the character. This, this is our model, and it's built based on, based on a, a long history of cognitive science work, um, that our con the concept that we form from a single example is, is something like a, an inverse motor program. So look at this new character and think about how you would draw it. You might draw it in the air in front of you. you know? So most people, if you say, draw this character in the air in front of you, they'll do something like this with their hand, right? Or maybe something like this. So these are six action traces of people drawing that character, basically, right? And even though the details are all different, the basic action plan is the same. Now, this is, this is what we're trying to capture, right? Um, we see that what's going on here, or our hypothesis, is that people are learning a model that is a causal model. It's a model of how the data was generated. But it's not just like a deep neural network. It's compositional. It has parts and subparts. It has structure. And we also think that it's supported by, you could call it a kind of meta-learning or learning to learn, right? Namely, that the parts and the probability distributions on them are built up over experience with other characters in this domain. So we built a model that we called Bayesian program learning, which articulates that generative process. Um, this is a, a sketch of the generative model a person might have in their head that they can use to imagine new characters, right? And then to be able to work backwards, again, using a kind of Bayesian inference to observe just one instance, let's say of one of these characters and work backwards to figure out what was the program that generated it. Now, the details of this, as Rich said, involve a lot of built-in structure. We have two levels here of probabilistic programs. There's a probabilistic token generating program, which takes a sketch of a character, like these mid-level things you see in the middle here, what's called the object template level, and generates different instances of the character by simulating the drawing process. And then we have what's effectively the prior. This is a type generating program whose output or return at the bottom there is a token generating program. This is a program that imagines new characters by combining a basic set of parts. Okay? Um, we built the overall structure of this model, but we learn all the parameters from held out training data. Okay? Um, and that's the same thing that other people who've used this in a more traditional machine learning method would just try to learn from scratch from the raw pixels on the training data and then see what they can do. Now, as Rich said, um, people, uh, well, we, we built a model that's close or that's actually a little bit better than human level performance. You know, close, this is percent error on this hard 20 way classification task. So chance is 95%. 5% or less is very close to perfect. Um, it does much better than what were at the time sort of baseline simple kinds of confidence. Um, although various confidence, um, as you can see in the green here, like the Siamese net that Rich and, and um, his students built, uh, start to get close to this. And people in the meantime have built a number of deep networks that can match or exceed human level classification on some versions of this task. But as Brendan wrote about in a recent paper on a sort of three-year progress report, we're actually still quite far 
um, from solving the Omniglot challenge. And it's really kind of remarkable because there's been, you know, hundreds of papers looking at this data set and a lot of claims and, and true claims that some version of the challenge can be met by a generic machine learning system. Um, but if you look at the original versions of the classification task where, which we showed where you have to classify within Alphabet, um, it's a lot harder task and a lot of networks which work well when you just give random distractors not from the same alphabet don't work nearly as well. Um, or for example here, I think the most interesting thing that hasn't yet been met is what happens if you try, if you make the training set closer to human scale? So instead of having 30 training alphabets, you just have five. Um, now, of course, humans, most human children learn only one alphabet at the beginning, um, but they learn other kinds of drawing. So we, we roughly approximate, you know, um, with you know roughly 150 different kinds of basic shapes and characters, and we say suppose that's your training set. So the the model that we built can still match human performance when it learns all of its priors just from that. But other approaches that work well when you have a lot more background training data and you have easier versions of the task, you know, are really still far from human level performance. Okay. More interestingly, though, the human version of the task isn't just about classifying. And the point of this challenge was to really also provide a test bed for building interestingly structured generative models. So people can imagine new characters, they can imagine new instances of given characters or even whole new characters. So as we showed in the paper, um, you can give somebody a new character that they haven't seen and ask them to draw a new instance. And you can ask our program to do that. And it's very hard to tell the difference, right? So, you know, which of these are the characters drawn by the human or the machine? It's hard to tell. Um, you can think about it. I'll tell, show you the answer in a second. Um, here's the ones that were drawn by the machine. But most people find it almost impossible to tell the human generated samples from the machine. Um, or you can try again here if you like. Again, here's the machine. It's, it's pretty hard to tell. Okay. Um, so, uh, but, but at the same time, as Rich said, a lot of people in machine learning would be, find it unsatisfying to have to build in so much structure about the domain. So you might ask, well, could we build generative models more from scratch? And there have been some interesting steps. So here I'm pointing to some work that was done a few years ago from uh, Danilo Resende and Ali Aslami and others at uh, DeepMind. And you know, they, they showed results which are in some ways quite impressive and in other ways also still far from human performance. So they use the draw style attentive uh, variational audit autoencoder or dynamic VAE to um, basically condition on a single character and then draw new samples, which you can see underneath. So the sample you condition on is on top. But if you look at the samples that are drawn, in many cases, they really just don't look like the same character, right? Like if you take this one here, it's very easy to see that some of these we would call the same character and others not. So we're, we're still far from matching what humans can do or what the more structured generative model can do. And I think that's because so far deep generative models don't have enough compositionality and causal to capture the true causal structure. But some of the techniques that people are working on, like in the, the talk uh, a couple of months before from Anirudh, you know, maybe might be steps towards that. Um, even more, you can actually take, um, you can not just generate new instances of, of a class, but you can go it to a higher level. I can give you 10 examples in a new alphabet and you can imagine new fictional characters in this alphabet you don't know. So here I'm showing our machine doing it and it's not perfect, but hopefully you can see that there's reasonable stylistic consistency. And you know, it remains open for whether we can have neural networks that can do that. Um, I'll, I'll just point to one more uh, interesting model in this domain, which was built by Luke Hewitt also helped by Tuan, Tuan Ang Lei and others, um, which is, this is a paper under review and hopefully will soon appear on archive. Um, it's, the, the focus of the paper is really on two things. One, there's a new learning algorithm here, which is called the memoized wake sleep algorithm. But it's really, I think even more interesting is the kind of structured generative models that we're trying to learn to learn. So think of this as like a generalization of what we were trying to do in the Omniglot setting, where we're trying to learn structured generative models which have symbolic components for parts, but also let's call it learned neural components to capture things that our initial symbolic language doesn't um, handle. And, and you know, we, we're trying to build in minimal symbolic structure, but learn all the rest from scratch. And since I'm running short on time, I won't really go into the details. I'll just call, make this a pointer to a paper that hopefully will soon appear. Um, but I'll show you the kind of thing that it does. It's inspired by the original wake sleep algorithm of Jeff Hinton and colleagues for training what at the time were very simple neural generative models. Okay. 
Um, and here, it's if you know the wake-sleep algorithm, it, it's a very similar idea here with two differences, that the generative models now can have symbolic structure to them. Like here, we use a language of regexes to capture symbolic structure in simple text patterns. But also, here's where the, the memoized part is that we're not just simply um, learning our recognition model from fantasies uh, or uh, imagined dreams from the generative model, but also we store the inferences that we've made, the best inferences that we've made during training. We, we memorize them, or you can think of them as memoized um, inferences. It's a kind of like weighted importance sampler, basically. Um, and by replaying those, those memories of good inferences, we can learn in just a much more efficient way. And just to sort of show what we can do now in, let's say, the Omniglot domain, we can start off with just a little bit of built-in structure, which is just the idea that you, you have a pen that can make basic strokes, right? But now we can learn everything else we can learn from scratch in ways that we can now, you know, take an observed character that we haven't seen before and do a reasonable job of reconstructing it. If you look closely, the inferred stroke sequences are, they're, they're too fine grained. They're not quite, they're more like the substrokes that people have but it's, it's a reasonable step, it's not bad. And this model is also the first one, at least that I know of, um, that can also make these inferences at the higher level. So we can give it a few examples of, a char of, a, of a different characters in a new alphabet, right? And it can then use that to condition its reconstruction of those characters, and, but also make up new instances. So on the bottom here, I'm showing the thing that I was pointing to that people and our much more structured built-in model could do. And again, it's far from perfect, but it's at least taking a step in the direction to try to handle a little bit of these more creative tasks. Is this going to take us all the way to what you know you could say is AI's oldest dream? The idea that we would build a machine that really learns everything that a person does that starts like a baby and learns like a child? No, I, totally not. <laughs> it's maybe a very small step in that direction, and I, I still don't think it tackles the real problems of like how could we, you know, build a physics engine. I'll, I'll just advertise one more small step, which is again, this is work that we've been doing for a while. It's some of the work I'm most excited about. Um, we had a, this is there was an earlier version of this kind of approach that was published by Kevin Ellis and colleagues in our group at Neurex 2018 called the EC2 algorithm. But our new version of this idea is, is much better and more powerful and we call it dream coder. It's also a kind of wake sleep learner. And in some sense, it's, it has a lot in common with the thing I showed you before. But the key is that we're now learning in general symbolic programming languages that can tackle many different kinds of tasks. So instead of a, a hand built um, language of like strokes or regexes, here we'll just take basically general Lisp code and we'll start with some primitives um, but we can start with a relatively small number of primitives um, and try to learn both to both the kind of neural recognition model that I was talking about before, which guides the search for programs, but we also try to learn a domain specific programming language. And in this sense, it's a kind of wake sleep algorithm where there's sort of two sleep phases, one which learns the neural recognition model and another which built, takes the starting set of primitives in our programming language and then builds new primitives by refactoring out shared components in programs that we've figured out to solve problems during the waking phase. So just to illustrate the idea, we might start off, let's say, trying to learn functions which manipulate lists of numbers. And here, the problem, un unbeknownst to us, is to sort a list of numbers in ascending order. We just see examples. We start off with some initial basic kind of list, uh, pro uh, list program components like map, fold, cons, car, could, or if greater than, that kind of thing. And from that, what we do is we try to build, or the system, by so it, we give it a number of these different tasks, and it builds a language, a system of concepts, which are basically more advanced functions in our original starting language. It builds a library of these concepts, new functions, which are defined in terms of old ones, and then yet newer functions, which are defined in terms of some of the new functions, that allow us now to assemble programs to solve our original problems that maybe we couldn't solve. So we start off solving only, sort, sorting a list is not an easy problem to just synthesize from examples from scratch. Okay, um, so and our, try to wrap up so we can take questions? Yeah, 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 I, I will wrap up in two minutes. Um, so our initial system isn't able to find a list sorting program by just doing search in our initial language, right? Um, after a few iterations of this wake sleep program learning, we can find a short program, this one here, which um, is very short. It's not the most efficient sorting algorithm, 
um, it intuitively basically just says like successively take the nth largest element of the list for n equals one, two, three, and then make a new list from that, right? Um, the key is it uses a concept which we could gloss as um, nth largest element, which is itself defined in terms of maximum filter, which are concepts it learned in previous iterations. And that's what it, it can find the solution because it's it, because it's now a short program in the learned language. But if we reproject that learned solution back to the original language, as you can see on the bottom, in terms of our starting state with a bunch of just you know folds and cons and and so on, um, you know it's it's so long we'd never find that program by any kind of bottom up search. So the the point here is that by abstracting out and compressing a language, we're able to um, learn to learn in a much more interesting structured symbolic way. Okay, so for details of this work, you can see again sort of early versions of it in the EC2 paper, but we hope to have a preprint on archive very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it allows us, I mean, some of the cool things that we try to do there are to learn, for example, generative languages for drawing, for building towers. There's a lot of cool things in that in this work, and I'll just um, sort of uh, uh, point you to check that out when it appears, hopefully, in the next uh, few weeks, I think. Um, so just to wrap up then, um, where do we go from this, right? How do we get beyond the core systems of knowledge? Well, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times, the real power of human learning comes once we learn natural language. We think that the kind of tools that I've just been talking about might be most interestingly applied in that context, right? So not just learning to sort lists or to draw pictures, um, but or to make tools, for example, but actually to learn how to put word meanings together in sentences. And then once you can learn that, then you can access the full sweep of human knowledge that's really built culturally. So just to wrap up then, I've tried to show you both a big picture vision as well as some of the machine learning that we're trying to do in the nearer term, right? We're far from having a machine that can fulfill AI's oldest dream, this idea of really starting like a baby and learning like a child. That's the dream. But we're starting to make some progress towards that by understanding from the science side, what are the kinds of things we should start with? What are the kinds of learning algorithms we should build? And then how we might start to engineer these things using both you know, tools which are, I think, right now mainstream in machine learning, like some elements of deep learning in neural networks, but also ideas that people aren't normally really thinking of as machine learning tools, but are broader AI or computer science tools like probabilistic inference in probabilistic programs, but also these program synthesis and neurally guided program synthesis techniques. So I hope that this is interesting to some of you. And if, you know, especially if you are also interested, not just in machine learning for technology applications, but for really trying to understand what intelligence is all about, and really most interestingly, I think, to understand our own minds, then I hope you'll, you'll um, also uh, work on these problems. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think we have time for one or two questions. Anyone want to ask one? Okay, uh, so we have a question, um, how about animal learning? Right, so um, I think you know it's um, uh, it's a good question. I'm not sure what you have behind that, so I'll try, I'll answer. I'll give my perspective and, and tell me um, what you uh, if, if if I don't get it, what you're after. Um, I think many people in in machine learning might say, okay, human learning, fine, that's really hard in advance, but maybe too hard. Why don't we work on simpler kinds of animal learning? And in some sense, that's what has led to the great successes of our field, right? So. Deep learning, let's say gradient descent in, in the form of backprop, um, but like basically error, error, gradient descent for minimizing error in um, predictive learning networks um, or reinforcement learning. Both of these uh, essential tools of modern machine learning were originally developed. And I think probably many people, but maybe not everybody knows this, all those basic models were worked out as models of animal learning in papers published in psychology or cognitive science or neuroscience journals decades ago in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. That's when the math of reinforcement learning and you know, stochastic gradient descent for that very simple non-deep learning networks um, was worked out. Right? Um, so you have to say that that was a great success by 
by trying to make models of animal learning, it gave us a lot of what we now call AI, right? At the same time, those were just very small steps towards real models of animal learning. Like if you look at how actual animals actually learn, these were just very simple mathematical models of the simplest kinds of learning you could do in controlled settings in the lab, like think like rats in a maze or Pavlov's dogs, you know. But real animal learning, like think about, um, you know, how um, birds learn to sing or think about how um, animals uh, learn to build nests, much of which they don't learn, <laughs> um, or how an animal learns to walk. Maybe the best example is think about learning to walk. Because again, we, we have really impressive results recently for reinforcement learning in kind of um, animal body-like simulation models, and even in some real robots for learning to walk. But still, for the most part, RL for learning to walk or learning locomotion takes many, many trials. But we, uh, probably we've all seen these videos of you know, um, the gazelle who's born on the savanna and pops out of the mother's womb and has to walk immediately within 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, they'll get eaten by a lion or their mother will leave them to run away from the lion, right? Um, so they have to learn in 10 minutes and they basically just get up, they maybe fall down, they get up, they fall down, and that's about it, right? And then not only are they walking in the sense of controlling their body, but they're walking over rough ground potentially around obstacles following their parent. So that, you know, that's a really good example of what real animal learning looks like. It's again, a very, very rapid few shot process. There's trial and error, okay? But, and there's certainly strong reinforcement signals, right? Um, but, you know, in some sense we might say much of the actual thing learning that, you know, machine learning people have been trying to do happened in evolution and it built a structure in the brain and the body of the animal that then now is able to do very flexible adaptive learning. And it's amazing what, four-legged animals can can walk or run or climb over. All right. So I think, you know, it's very interesting both to see where you can get from small steps towards very basic approximations to animal learning, but it's also interesting to ask, well, what kind of learning system would that have to be? How could you engineer a system that could learn that quickly and that flexibly, right? It's not magic. Um, and I think some of the ideas, for example, that we've been talking about here using physics engines um, for intuitive physics, one of our best hypotheses about why we have a physics engine in our brain is because we built it to control our bodies and to control objects. As I think many people are aware, if you, if, you know, if you follow state of the art in robotics is there's been a lot of success in using, you know, pretty strongly made based model based um, systems based on the right kinds of physics engines. Mujoko that everybody or lots of people use in deep reinforcement learning, right? It was originally built not to do deep RL, but to do robotic control trajectory optimization. And whether it's the work of Emo Todorov and Igor Mordach, who, who uh, you know, Emo being behind Mujoko or Rust Hedrake at MIT, many other people, um, I'm just citing a few people that I know and have worked with, um, you know, the idea that we might, that, that we have a physics engine in our, in our brains to control our bodies and to guide how we manipulate objects seems actually quite compelling. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful engineering thesis, and it might really be part of the basis of how, for example, we learn to walk or how to manipulate objects. So, you know, again, that's that's the kind of animal learning I would do. It's by no means exclusively human, but it's the sort of structures that human learning builds on. All right, thanks. So I think we'll have to cut it off there since we have a new talk. I'm starting in just a couple of minutes. Um, oh, but, yeah, I, I didn't realize that. Um, Is this uh, yeah, Bean's talk? Bean, Bean, yeah. Um, oh, excellent. Okay, great. So, I'm glad that got rescheduled. Okay, good. Yeah, well, thanks yeah. for everybody's attention, and I'm happy to talk more offline with anybody interested. Thank you. Thanks.